hello. Hello, I'm Gary Chartier from the Center for a Stateless Society and La Sierra University School of Business. My topic this morning is simple and straightforward. There's war and then there's everything else. Nothing matters more than war. It's the worst thing governments do and it exemplifies all the other destructive things they do. All kinds of aggression are of course unjustifiable, but war is the key instance of aggression makes no sense to oppose aggression while you ignore the, the sheer awfulness of war. Just as it makes no sense to oppose war without also seeing other kinds of aggression as troubling on comparable grounds. The violence of war is troubling for many reasons. Death is of course obviously the biggie. Before the 20th century, state violence, which of course includes more than declared wars, uh, but which will have seen, been the work either of military personnel or of others acting under the state's orders. Declared wars likely claimed, state wars rather, likely claimed between 89 million and 260 million lives. Reasonable estimates place the total number of war-related deaths in the 20th century alone at over, possibly well over 100 million people. Perhaps 15 million people died in or as, or as a result of World War I. World War II may have claimed some 55 million lives. To focus on more recent events, documented non-combatant deaths in Iraq since the 2003 invasion totaled around 100,000 a couple of years ago. Over 31,000 U.S. government military personnel have been wounded in action there more than 4,200 military personnel and over 1,100 contractors have been killed. Be but of course this isn't the only thing that's wrong with state-made wars. Not just the sheer numbers, but also the lack of discrimination. That is to say, standard just war theory says, and I think rightly, it's one thing to fire at non-combatants. That's very different from firing at combatants. And state actors, frankly, ignore that distinction repeatedly. The reality is that state actors just aren't held responsible on a typical basis for conduct that they commit in wartime, even if it's clearly unjustifiable, even if it's clearly uh, uh, something that would result in liability in other circumstances. So they are all too likely to cause indiscriminate harm to noncombatants. Sometimes, of course, as in the case of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, noncombatants are actually targeted, but even when they're not, they are harmed with alarming frequency, far more often than would be the case if state actors actually asked themselves whether they would be willing that they or their loved ones be subjected to the risks of collateral harm they're imposing on others. This is, of course, especially true when state actors opt for long-distance bombardment, whether from cannons or airplanes or drones as an alternative to on-the-ground engagement. Bombardment obviously has the potential to decrease casualties on the side of those responsible for it. They don't have to show up on the ground. And so to reduce drains on the state's coffers and political problems for leaders overseeing war efforts, you can see why leaders opt for it. But it is morally dubious in many cases because of its relatively indiscriminate character. Of course, this isn't the only problem, though another one that's obviously related to it is blowback, right? War breeds resentment among those whose loved ones are killed, whose possessions are destroyed or stolen, whose societies uh, come as a result of war to be dominated by autocrats, and this resentment obviously can lead to further violence. Wars lead to even more violence. Military intervention and political manipulation in the Middle East, uh, most recently the two-front war in Iraq and Afghanistan, has led to passionate antipathy to the U.S. government across the region and indeed the whole Muslim world. Ongoing terror campaigns don't reflect some mythical distaste for American decadence. That's just silly. They're focused intensely on the goal of dislodging U.S. government soldiers and military investments from the region. 
Public statements identified as originating with the Al-Qaeda terrorist network consistently justify terrorist attacks as responses to military action, to the U.S. government's long-term ongoing intervention in Iraq. Remember when Secretary of State Madeleine Albright famously said that maintaining an embargo that led to the deaths of Iraqi children was worth it because it contained Saddam Hussein? Remember that? So that kind of thing for instance, or, or the presence of U.S. government armed forces in Saudi Arabia. One of the defendants in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing case said the same thing. The 2010 Times Square would-be bomber made the same point again. All purposeful, or indeed indiscriminate, attacks on noncombatants are wrong. There are no exceptions. I'm not trying to justify terrorist violence. But terrorist violence directed at American targets is explicable. It's not a product of some visceral hatred for American freedoms, nor is it part of some sinister master plan for the conquest of the world. It is a direct response to perceived injustice and the violence of war. The, then, of course, there's the growth of tyranny. State actors' perceived need to mobilize and consolidate domestic support for war leads to the implementation of repressive measures including censorship, propaganda, torture, surveillance, and due process violations of various kinds. Not only are these troubling on their own, they are also all too likely to persist after war's official end. Wars create multiple opportunities, repeated opportunities, for the abusive exercise of power. Revolutionary war era state governments created conscription programs and executed deserters without trial. Would-be warmongers passed the Alien and Sedition Acts at the end of the 18th century to suppress criticism of policies with the potential to lead to war. Both sides in the war between the states implemented conscription programs and imposed criminal penalties on vocal dissenters. During World War I, Woodrow Wilson, who is hailed as a progressive hero by lots of people who've never paid any attention to his actual record, promised that a firm hand of stern repression would be used against putatively disloyal opponents. The United States government rounded up domestic radicals in large numbers during the war, prosecuting people just for expressing opposition to the war. Just for expressing opposition, people were prosecuting. World War II provided military and political leaders in the U.S. with excuses to intern people simply because of their Japanese backgrounds without any determination of individual risks, and anti-sedition legislation provided cover for crackdowns on free speech. Cold War era prosecutions and persecutions of leftists with no actual involvement in espionage or in Soviet plans for imperial expansion are painfully well known. Vietnam-era groups opposed to the state's Southeast Asian adventurism were targeted by law enforcement agencies for infiltration and manipulation, and people were prosecuted simply for the symbolic act of burning draft cards. War still provides excuses for human rights abuses. Before George Bush announced a global war on terror, had you ever heard of waterboarding? or extraordinary rendition. Now, waterboarding, in fact, was practiced by the U.S. military in the Philippines a hundred years ago. But how many people today remember that? Did it ever occur to you that agents of the U.S. government would force defenseless prisoners to feel like they were drowning? Do you think U.S. government, did, did, did you think U.S. government personnel would capture people and hand them over to agents of foreign governments who would beat and torture them? Did you imagine that money you paid in taxes would be used to create black sites around the world, purportedly outside the Constitution's reach, where prisoners would be held without trial. Now, Barack Obama's inaugural address told us clearly that Bush's war on terror wasn't over. The Obama administration obviously has no intention of prosecuting Bush-era torturers. The theoretical possibility of trials frankly isn't even on the table, and there's no realistic chance they'll actually happen. There's some reason to think that the administration's rules preclude torture by U.S. government workers, at least in official terms, but not necessarily by foreigners at U.S. government sites. And of course, who gets to define what's torture? The torturers. The administration seems to be using carefully crafted rhetoric to distance itself from its predecessor's awful human rights record while still keeping its own options open. And, of course, the problem doesn't stop at the water's edge. Is there anything more fun than waiting in an airport security line for a humiliating search? 
Do you like knowing that guards are keeping your friends and family members from walking through security checkpoints with you to your departure gate? Aren't you glad to know that government agents have been listening in on American cell phone calls or issuing national security letters demanding people's private information while prohibiting anyone from revealing the fact that they've obtained it? Freedom was the first casualty of the American state's undeclared war. As a senator, Barack Obama supported reauthorization of the USA Patriot Act despite the fact that he had earlier noted civil liberties problems with the law. And he signed up for the FISA Amendment Act, which purported to make warrantless wiretaps legal. Just be glad Congress can't change the Constitution. And gave telecoms a free pass for helping out with the Bush administration's domestic surveillance program. War gives the state an excuse to hide information from the public, too. Not so long ago, the Department of Justice argued that because a case involves state secrets, the entire case should be dismissed. This is one of many instances where this has happened. It said the government's claimed state secrets privilege could justify keeping the government itself from being sued. That's the Obama Department of Justice. Now, during his presidential campaign, Obama criticized the Bush administration for its expansive reading of the state secrets privilege. Now, his DOJ is taking the same position as its Bush era predecessor. The government claims it needs the state secrets privilege and other secrecy rules to keep us safe from our adversaries in the war on terror. But the principal effect of secrecy rules is to keep us from holding the state accountable. They make it easier for fraud, violations of civil liberties, and torture to go undetected and unremedied. Randolph Bourne famously observed that war is the health of the state. Everybody remembers that quote, but it's worth repeating again. War is the health of the state. The war party uses the endless war on terror, which does little to keep Americans safe, but which does foster intense anti-American sentiment by casting the U.S. government in the role of a global bully as an excuse to justify the abuse of human rights, the erosion of freedom, the wasteful expenditure of our money, and the expansion of executive power, hiding abuses from view by appealing to the value of state secrecy. In wartime, the state seeks to silence or marginalize dissenters, dismissing those who oppose the official story as unpatriotic or even traitorous. Dissidents are branded as dangerous, put on watch lists, ridiculed, and harassed. Now, they may not be imprisoned, as of course some were during World War I, but establishment cronies and apologists in the mainstream media treat them as silly, naive, and so obviously wrong that they may be effectively silenced, their voices thus rendered inaudible to most people. Here's another problem. States need standing armies to drive their war machines. If a society features a voluntary militia to defend against invasion or violent civil unrest, the militia will do its work and then disband. Members of the militia will only participate in its activities if they believe it's doing something important, if it's defending their interests or those of their neighbors or friends or people they care about. A standing army, by contrast, is ready to be deployed. It's waiting to be deployed. A state doesn't have to wait for an attack or the threat of an attack to make use of its standing army. If it wants to invade another country, orders for the invasion simply need to be passed along its military chain of command, and full-time soldiers and sailors will begin to do the jobs they've been trained to perform. The existence of standing armies facilitates the manipulation of soldiers' loyalty. Personnel in a standing army are acculturated to think of themselves as performing invaluable tasks for their community to trust and obey their superiors, to see what they do as an expression of loyalty. When the state snaps its fingers, they'll be likely to comply. By contrast, volunteer members of a militia are not primarily soldiers or sailors. They're teachers, electricians, accountants, steelworkers, lawyers, journalists, plumbers. They have their own lives to live. This means both that they are likely to be resistant to attempts to persuade them to give up their ordinary lives to participate in war, and that they will have had considerable opportunity to develop independent perspectives on what's going on in the world. They won't have been subjected to constant propaganda reminding them as their of their role as guardians of freedom or democracy or the homeland. A state has the resources to continually subject not only soldiers but everyone else to constant propaganda in support of war. Once they decide on war, the state's leaders can use the enormous tax-generated resources at their disposal to convince the public the danger is imminent, that the intended enemies of the war they seek to undertake are evil, that justice is on their side, and that victory is certain. To be sure, smaller non-state groups can propagandize for war, too. But such groups simply wouldn't have the resources, the influence, or the stature of the government of a state.
State officials enjoy an irrationally cultivated prestige that boosts their credibility when they propagandize for war, in addition, of course, to the money they've got to deploy for propaganda. And they repeatedly claim that they are in possession of information justifying military action which ordinary people simply lack and that they must, therefore, simply be trusted. At the same time, they can maintain that they are unwilling to release this information more broadly because to do so would purportedly compromise everyone's safety. It's for your own good, they can announce. That's why we're not telling you. But take our word for it. I abominate and detest the idea of a government where there is a standing army, early U.S. politician George Mason once said. For Luther Martin, who was one of Mason's contemporaries, it was obvious that when a government wishes to deprive its citizens of freedom and reduce them to slavery, it generally makes use of a standing army. Elbridge Gerry, remember gerrymandering, that's where we get the name, described a standing army as the bane of liberty. Thomas Jefferson included a ban on standing armies among the fetters against doing evil which no honest government, I don't think there is such a thing, should decline. I think they were onto something. Standing armies, and I'll use armies as a term of convenience to refer to all kinds of military forces, are armies not simply called up for defensive purposes in times of war, but maintained on a full-time basis by the state. Now, in principle, of course, such armies could exist without states, and a state needn't have a standing army. So an argument against a standing army isn't a knockdown argument for anarchism. Uh, I'm always looking for those kinds of arguments, obviously. But there's a natural connection between standing armies and states. States can afford to maintain large standing armies because they can support them using tax money. Standing armies are more likely to attract members when they are maintained by states because states can spend enormous amounts to promote recruitment. This, of course, is if they don't actually uh, recruit, quote unquote, uh, using inscription. States can encourage people to join standing armies using propaganda that manipulates people's natural bent toward loyalty by focusing that loyalty on the state itself rather than on genuine local ties and relationships, by convincing people that it deserves their loyalty and that that loyalty is best expressed through military service, the state can manipulate people into joining the military in a way that, say, a community association or firm that provided security services simply couldn't. The state has unique opportunities to make war happen with standing armies. State-created standing armies foster deference to and trust in authority. Ordinary people who defend their community while fighting in a militia return to their ordinary work, continue making their own decisions. People who were trained specifically to be soldiers learn to obey, to do what they're told without question. And that's one of the reasons many of the founders of the reasons many of the founders of the United States distrusted standing armies. The kind of mindset required to be a good soldier simply isn't the same as the mindset required to be free and self-governing. States can use standing armies for repression, too. While well, the typical claim is that military forces are maintained for defensive operations, they can easily be used to stop dissent and keep ordinary people in check. Again, the point is not that large groups of armed people couldn't do this in a stateless society, too, but that the state has the resources to invest in maintaining a powerful military machine which it can proceed to use effectively at its discretion to beat, arrest, torture, and kill dissenters. State-made wars are frequently fought by conscripts. Conscription is obviously a species of temporary, or not so temporary, enslavement. And employing it seems to be an unjust means to achieve any objective, even a potentially noble one. State actors tend for predictable reasons to undertake wars for dubious reasons, for national or personal glory, for imperial dominance, or to feather the nests of their corporate cronies. Not that good motives somehow justify the destructiveness of war, but bad motives, in fact, are frequently in play. The motives are bad enough, but too often, at least, some state actors succeed in using war to extend their government's capacities for control and exploitation over others. High-flown rhetoric often masks imperial ambition, and would-be empire builders are happy to take advantage of opportunities provided by idealists in order to pursue their own dubious goals. The United States government, for instance, maintains an empire of nearly 1,000 bases around the world. Now, they're all there for good reason, of course. Even when warmakers' motives are noble, as I frankly doubt they almost ever are, lack of knowledge about the situation on the ground and the inherent unpredictability of the future trip up efforts to do good. 
War making by states helps to birth an all too intimate relationship between politicians, military leaders, and economic elites happily dependent on the money provided to pay for military equipment and other resources. The wealth siphoned off by these elites is often misspent even from the perspective of those who favor war in principle, given the wastefulness and inefficiency of war production undertaken in tandem with the state. The state provides obviously all kinds of disincentives for efficiency. But it also gives them more access to and influence over politicians, enabling these elites both to pay for non-war related privileges and also, and even more troublingly, to push for continued preparedness for war, to propagandize during peacetime and all too frequently even for new hostilities, so that the war machine feeds on itself. State-made wars are funded, of course, through taxes extracted from the unwilling, which ought to be troubling because nothing entitles the state to claim anyone's resources at gunpoint, especially when those resources are being used to fund war. Now, since raising taxes overtly is, as we know, politically difficult, wars have increasingly come to be funded in another way, using inflationary money creation by central banks. This ultimately functions, of course, much like a tax, even though it's not officially a tax, destroying the value of people's savings and exerting distorting effects throughout the economy. Either way, whether you're talking about funding through taxation or funding through uh, inflation or indeed funding through plunder, the costs are unbearable. Now, it's not easy to estimate costs for wars throughout history, but World War I cost the participants some $2.6 trillion in today's dollars, while the inflation-adjusted bill for World War II seems to have been about $3.3 trillion. A Congressional Research Service analyst estimates that the United States government spent $341 billion in today's dollars on the Korean War and $738 billion in today's dollars on the Vietnam War. And of course, this ignores various indirect and non-monetary costs, as well as financial costs borne by non-Americans. Notice how these costs are so often reported, just in terms of costs to the war makers. We can't be certain just how much Americans will ultimately pay for war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and for military base security upgrades initiated since the September 11, 2001 attacks. But a recent CRS estimate suggests that expenditures approved from fiscal year 2001 through the middle of fiscal year 2010 totaled $1.121 trillion. That's roughly $400 per American per year, or $1,600 for a household of four. And remember, the U.S. government's effort, war efforts are being paid for with borrowed money. The bill will be even higher when it finally comes due. Now take a variety of indirect costs into account, and the hit to Americans' pocketbooks looks even worse. In fact, two economists, Linda Vilmes and uh, Nobel laureate Joe Stiglitz, have argued that the total costs of war in Iraq and Afghanistan could reach at least three trillion dollars and will likely be higher than that. Now Barack Obama has announced the end of combat operations in Iraq, but the fact is those combat operations still continue as troops remain. And here's another problem with these huge costs. There's a failure to ensure that decision makers themselves internalize the costs. They can shift these costs to others. Funding through taxation or money creation is troubling, then, not just because of the amazing, amazing costs, but also because since state actors are not covering the costs of warfare themselves, they don't have to pay out of pocket, it will be tempting for them to initiate wars unwisely without any regard for their likely cost. And once they have begun wars, they can be expected to overspend. They won't feel pressures to economize because the money isn't theirs and they can keep generating it. And of course, this will lead those who desire wars and are responsible for them to continue these wars long after they would do so if the costs were internalized. War leaders responsible for conflicts which they and their cronies can force others to pay for will con uh, confront incentives to use the vast sums of money, the vast sums of money that states at war typically claim to enrich these very cronies. Thus, not only will ordinary people be despoiled to fund politicians' war efforts, but resources will be misdirected from the uses to which ordinary people would prefer to put them. Ordinary people who don't want to spend money on the cronies probably don't want to spend money on the wars. Tax or central bank driven funding for warfare also means that it will be more likely to be carried on on a grand scale. With more troops, more weapons, more ambitious goals, and more willingness to remain engaged for longer periods. Now one practical and obvious effect of this is that there will be more destruction, right? The more war, the more destruction there will be. 
Another is that mistakes will be more likely with potentially awful consequences. And I don't mean just targeting mistakes or other tactical errors per se, though obviously those are very real and very serious. Rather, my concern is with long-term objectives. Now, consider the alternative, right? Suppose you've got a group of volunteers like the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, folks who went to Spain in the 1930s to fight the fascists. Now, that group of volunteers, a group of volunteers like that, might seek to turn back a tyrant. State actors can delude themselves into thinking, by contrast, that they can remake a region of the world. Bigger military undertakings leave more room for errors of this kind and the concomitant commitment of resources in utterly irrational ways. The Abraham Lincoln Brigade can take on a few people with limited resources, and of course the members or those who fund them have to support these efforts. By contrast, the state can just move on blundering ahead indefinitely with absurd plans in mind and it can continue to pursue those kinds of plans. Think about, again, the kinds of vast plans for, for remaking the Middle East that the neocons played with in the mid-2000s because they don't have to pay for them. The vast cost of state-driven wars leads to a massive misdirection of resources from productive to unproductive uses, minimizing opportunities for investment in productive activities that provide people with things they actually want and need. Instead, these resources are used to fund the creation of stuff that is going to be either blown up or simply stored away after having been used to kill people and destroy their things. The human capacity for violence is magnified, glorified, and protected from criticism of the state's military machine. And the state's wars, in turn, provide new opportunities for the state to grow, not only by expanding its boundaries, but by enlarging its administrative apparatus. I mean, bureaucracies, as we know, never shrink. They dig in their heels and protect themselves. The permanent military forces only a state could afford to maintain instill fear at home and abroad and train people for obedience to arbitrary masters. And diplomatic and economic power, still backed by force and exercised in tandem with the economic elites who are the state's cronies, enable the imperial state to exercise influence far beyond its borders, inexpensively and while maintaining the illusion of amiability. That's why there's nothing more important than war. That's why opposition to injustice has to begin with opposition to the worst case of aggression, the aggression of war. There are people who will tell you that this or that other issue, social or political or cultural or economic, has to be focused on and that war has to take a sideline. And to that I say no. To that I say absolutely not. The domestic and foreign consequences alike of war are so devastating. The consequences for those who are its victims abroad and those who are its victims at home. For those who suffer from the heavy hand of the national security state at home and for those who suffer under dropping bombs abroad. The consequences are so great for all of us that there is no alternative to treating war as the most important political issue on the political agenda. There's war, and then there's everything else. Now, it is, I see that there are, okay, so there were zero views a second ago. Now we're back to 21. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to thank everybody who's participated in this conversation. I think the issue is really important, and I encourage the conversation to continue in the chat room. I need to absent myself at this time, uh, but I look forward to participating in further Agora IO conversations, and I hope that fighting the wars, stopping the wars, will continue to be a high priority for everyone who cares about freedom and justice.